Good morning, everyone. This is a very important program. I want to be sure we get started on time so that we have plenty of time for both the presentations and the questions. I also want to be clear from the beginning that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube following the end of this session. So now I welcome you to this session called Out in the Open, Recent Governance Developments at IFLA. Many of you have heard rumors, read articles, received emails and draft statements, etc., about recent events and changes at IFLA headquarters, and we are concerned about the future of an organization which many of us have devoted substantial parts of our professional lives to develop and support. Today's session is designed to respond to those concerns in as forthright a manner as possible while respecting legal constraints and confidentiality agreements. But even more important from my point of view, this session is intended for all of us to focus on our next steps that are necessary to reassure IFLA members that IFLA's leaders are focused on and committed to our mission to inspire, engage, enable, and connect the global library field. I'm joined on stage today by several colleagues. First, Barbara Leeson, IFLA president. Hello Loker, the delegate of the governing board. Yap Naber, IFLA treasurer elect. And Christian Bolt, governing board member. As many of you know, IFLA's new president elect, Vicki McDonald, was not able to join us in Dublin this year. So I'm now going to call on President Leeson to bring us up to date on the situation at IFLA headquarters and report on the governing board's responses to various requests recently received from IFLA's units and members. President Leeson and then will be followed by any kind of questions from people in the audience. Thank you. Pardon? Uh, from Stellenbosch University. Um, I just want to know, um, just if you could just confirm the time for the period, the time period for the session. Is it until 12 or is it until 12.30? I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't get the question. The question is, what is the period, the time period for this? Is it until 12? Is it 11 to 12 or is it 11 to 12.30? We just need to be clear that we have enough time to deal with oh, the sorry. issue. So the what is the time? 11 o'clock to 12.30. To 12.30, yeah, thank you very pardon. much. Yes. Hello everybody. Thank you, Winston, for the introduction. Thank you for being willing our facilitator for these 90 minutes. I see a room of people who are committed. I see a room of people who are engaged with IFLA for many years, who are interested in the well-being of IFLA and the future of IFLA, and I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you very much. Also, I want to thank those people who are not only here in the room, but also have addressed the governing board with several points with several issues, and we are, of course, we, the governing board and myself as well, we are going to take that up, and we are responding to you today in, in speaking, and there will be responses, of course, in writing. Uh, the responses in writing will come later. We thought that it is a good idea to have the feedback, the ideas, the comments, of this room, of you, and then discuss this together with other things, letters like that, um, tomorrow in our governing board meeting. And from there, you will get responses from the governing board. So we have a uh, well <laughs> secure the future of IFLA slide here. And my first point is the contract of the Secretary General, the investigations, the decisions of the governing board regarding the, the contract of the Secretary General, and so on. You see this. Just first of all, I 
my role now is to give you an update and most of all, a clarification uh, where we stand with the Secretary General and the contract and so on. The whole issue started at the end of last year when there were complaints from staff uh, repeatedly to the governing board uh, about the management and the management style of the Secretary General. The governing board took immediately up these accusations and decided to have investigations to clarify about or to, to get clarification about the sound basis of this investigation from HQ. There were two investigations led, one in December and one in January until February. One investigation was an investigation mainly on paper, the first one, and the second investigation was an investigation uh, with interviews. So the second company firm held interviews with the staff who was willing to do this. It was all an anonymous process and also with uh, the Secretary General. The result of the investigation led to a position of the governing board that there is a trust in the management style uh, of the Secretary General and the Governing Board had no trust anymore that there would be an improvement. This not having trust for an improvement in the management and management style of headquarters led to a decision of the Governing Board to terminate the contract of the Secretary General. And now, please listen carefully, this was a decision to terminate the contract. The contract is not terminated yet because I think many of you, if not all, can understand that a decision like that is a highly legally issue, highly legal issue. And there is a court case pending now about the termination of the contract, about the decision of the termination of the contract. We would have liked to have a decision by the Dutch court as soon as possible and of course before this Congress. And if not, at least before the General Assembly on the 25th of August. But staff shortages also in law courts, not only in airports, and the holiday season made it impossible that we have the law, call, the law case solved before the General Assembly, at least. The day which is now terminated for the law case in the Dutch court, you know, just a remark, that IFLA is working in the Netherlands, the headquarters is in the Netherlands, so Everything legal which has to be done is related to Dutch law. There is no international law which we follow. The seat is in The Hague and therefore it is Dutch law which is relevant for all legal actions. So this court case will be in the beginning of October. And some people say it will be quickly done some others say, we don't know. You see, we, in Germany, we say you have two lawyers and you have three opinions, at least. <laughs> so we will see. This day is fixed now. IFLA will be at courts. We have a, a, a legal firm in Amsterdam which is renowned for labor law. We will see. That is, that is one point. What I want to add regarding the investigations, there was, it turned out 
that the allegations of being bullied were not accepted by the firm who did the investigation. So the allegation of bullying was not, uh, was not approved. I also want to add, because I know that labor law in different countries is different, and that the cultures of uh, handling contracts and especially finishing contracts, terminating contracts in the different countries of the world are also different. Already, I'm an employer in Germany. My labor law, which I have to abide to, is in many aspects different from the Dutch law. And so I can imagine, and perhaps you can imagine, the, the widespread different um, well, versions, let's put it like that. Therefore, I want to stress two, three points, because it's also related to several rumors which come or which are now here out in IFLA. There was no financial mismanagement. The reason was no financial mismanagement. There was no fraud, and there was no harassment of any art or any way um, by the Secretary General. This was not the reason. The reason was the distrust that the management style and the management of headquarters of the Secretary General would improve as soon as, was, as it was necessary. So, when you have a Secretary General who is not working, then who steers IFLA? It could not be the governing board. The governing board is a strategic body. The decision had to be, that was the decision to terminate the contract was at the beginning of March. The beginning of March was less than four months before this Congress. We have in Helen Mandel, uh, Deputy Secretary General, who was busy with this, but there was a lack, a lack of management resources. So the governing board decided and asked within the governing board, and we had legal advice for this as well. I'm a German. I, if I know there should be a legal issue, I don't act without legal advice. And so the legal advice said, we can choose a member of the governing board to do this. And the governing board chose Harlo Locher to do this job. It's a paid job. And he had several titles. Now he's called, I give you the long title now, he's called the delegate of the governing board to execute the tasks of the secretary general. Why are you laughing? <laughs> so now we shortened this to the delegate. So Harlow is now the delegate. There are many delegates here in this room, but he is a special one. <laughs> this is one thing. And he has a contract with IFLA to execute all these tasks. Well, now the conference. The Congress is here, and you are there as well. Another very important task was the improvement of the situation in headquarters. That was a very important task because the whole thing started with this issue. And another task was that when the contract with the Secretary General is terminated, we need another secretary general, not a delegate. We cannot go on, and Harlow, I think, doesn't want to get on as a delegate. So we thought we could quickly start the search for a new secretary general. But again, legal issues. As long as the court case is not solved, we cannot go out and officially start a search. That is also legal advice which we got. We work together with lawyers, we work together with notaries, 
And I can tell you, it's sometimes annoying because you think, well, this is logical. This, is, this must be like that. Oh, no. Oh, no. When, you, when it comes to legal issues, I don't know if are there lawyers in this room or people who have studied law, but my, <laughs> I didn't do it. But um, yes, that is, that is something which should be considered very well, that it's not our decisions which we can take freely. We have to abide to law. We have to abide to GDPR, and all these issues are on the table, and we have to look at them. And if we don't do that, we risk a lot. And I don't want to risk anything for IFLA, but I want IFLA to flourish in the future. And this is what I want to do. So this was the first step to tell you. And Winston, I give over to you again. Or hello, I don't know. Thank you, Barbara, Miss President. Uh, Just uh, some uh, key notes on communication because we were also criticized as governing board about the communication. And Barbara mentioned that we decided in uh, March and we had uh, to negotiate with the former Secretary General about a friendly agreement that uh, took some time. And in April of April, we uh, then released the information that the Secretary General is released from his duties. On the 15th of April, we had to clarify the motivation for that decision, what uh, already Barbara has done now. And the 21st of April, the president's letter to all members went out. Then we had on the 28th of April, a Zoom meeting with the uh, attendees from the regional and professional council. And later on, on the 20th May, we had a personal information and the standing committee of the MLIS uh, Management of Library Association section that I'm the chair of. To give this information, explain this uh, intervening decision governing board has taken in a short time and based on professional investigation. Now concerning the changes at the headquarters, I can just uh, some give some, some information. I started in April, two, we two weeks after the engagement uh, decided by the governing board. And we had uh, just uh, two weeks after that an emergency situation concerning the security and the reli reliability of the IT structure. Because the website went down to a image by a person and uh, we couldn't the booking registration of the Congress was no longer working. We had to immediately have an external company to help us. Then uh, I had a lot of talks with the staff in the, uh, Den Haag and uh, we integrated together a new management structure because uh, the investigation showed that there's a lack of management, of structure, of planning and of communication. And uh, that is what I did. General support of the management capaci capacity as good as I could do. And I would say the first remarks on the feedback from the uh, staff members are very positive. And also we have the change, the, the, this, the governing board decided to change the auditor and the notary. And now uh, I give the mic to Jaap Naber, our new treasurer, who will say something about what he is planning in this field. Thank you very much, Harlow. I'm going to stand up because I don't feel comfortable sitting. What you see is what you get out in the open. <laughs> so there's nothing hidden. You can ask me anything. Like Harlow said, we decided uh, to get a new accountant because my first impression when first being presented the annual accounts was how am I going to understand this? And if I, as a seasoned professional, am not going to understand it, how are you, not all familiar with finance, even more going to understand it? So, happy to, the t decision was taken to switch to a new accountant, who, according to me, is the independent third party 
we need and that was requested for by many of you in the letter that was demanded. Um, and I say this on purpose because uh, we have a register for accounts. Uh, so any accountant is very eager to find any little detail that is not okay because if they sign off your, your financial statements and they're not correct, they may lose their registry. That means they may lose their income. Would any organization in Holland or anywhere in the world be willing to risk that for an organization that is very important, but only has a balance sheet total of one and a half million euros? I don't think so. So for me, that's a trusted third party who will have a good look at finances, but also at governance. Uh, for example, the people we use in Rotterdam, we all, always take an interim uh, control. They look at your inter internal procedures, are the processes, are they being followed, are there overrides of control, all that kind of stuff, and they give you an advice on that. The advice is given to the board of directors, who then give an immediate order to the people in the, uh, in the office to improve. So, if we get that report, if we get, to my opinion, we get the new accountant doing that for us, there's no need for a forensic accountant. I've, in my life, I've visited thousands of companies being uh, um, a risk underwriter for credit insurers, and forensic accountants were only hardly ever called in, only when you talk about hundreds of millions of euros. So I would be saying, let's try to not throw good money after bad money. Let's first work with this new accountant, look at what he has to say, make the improvement process, and then see if we're still finding uh, trouble. So I've ta already talked about the second step I'm gonna do, the interim control, which usually takes place in the fall. And we need that right now with the situation as, as it is. So the critical look will be there. We have the recommendation, not only on finance, but also in HR, IT, uh, finance and risk. So it's wider than only finance, and just looking at, have all the things been booked right? And extra points of attention. Um, that may be brought forward by you in the rest of the meeting, so I'm happy to hear whatever are your concerns that we could also include in the, uh, um, the question you're going to ask for the new account. So then the, my third thing, it was like communication could be clearer, we hiding information, are we, why are we being so obscure? Well, we have a little bit of a complex uh, structure if you look at it from the outside. Um, there's a reason for this. Uh, so we have to really look into it and if we should continue with that structure or if we could simplify it also to improve communication, to be able to better explain why things are going the way they are going. It's increasing transparency as well. And I'm going to do the workshops for non-financials, why it's important that you who are all engaged and, and working so hard for this, this organization, you know what we're all, how we are spending the money, if everything is correct, and uh, uh, if you would want to understand, you, know, you need to, maybe we should train you a little bit, explain how things are working. So that's what I'm, I intend to do in the fall. Looking forward to any uh, inscriptions. Once the registration is open, I'll, uh, I'll give you a sign on the, uh, on the internet page. Um, and like I said, we have those entities, uh, a lot of questions were asked uh, in the past about why are all these financial flows between one limited liability and the other, and how does it relate to the holding, how does it relate to even questions about SIGL, well SIGL is an independent entity, is nothing to do with uh, IFTA. We may be happy that they are giving us money to pay for a lot of our expenses. Um, that's one thing. Apart from these workshops, I also intend to go to a quarterly reporting, comparing actuals versus budget, but also having the look ahead at, you know, what, is, what, is, what, what are we looking at for the rest of the year? Not only that, I see I've forgotten to, to mention one thing. In the fall, we have to look at the budget for the coming year, because hopefully, and I'm very sure, and that's also my intention, 
I want IFLA to still celebrate her centenary and long after that. So we, we're going to secure that basis. We're going to report on you. We're going to com communicate. So I'm happy to receive what any kind of suggestion would be helpful to, to do that. Thank you very much. All right, I want to thank you, uh, Barbara, Hallo, and Yap, for these uh, introductory remarks, responding to many of the known questions and concerns that have been presented already. We have a very simple format for today. We have these presentations, and now we move for the next hour into a question and answer period. So people may start coming to the microphone. My intention is just to move left, my left to right and go as long as we have questions, but still stopping at 12.30. So I do invite people now to come forward if you have additional questions or comments that you would like to make. I can't see all the microphones, so. If you want to go to the microphone, please. Certainly. Uh, no, so, certainly I have to open. Number two um, here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Shaukri Selim. And uh, I would like to ask Barbara, do you think that the decision of the governing board to terminate the Secretary General was a rapid decision or uh, must be done like that? As normally we warn, uh, as you said, there is no enhancement, there is no fraud, there is nothing. Uh, serious uh, against the Secretary General. Then <clears throat> the decision was fast, the very fast decision to take terminate, or we can warn him first that he had the bad management and he must change his style. Barbara, you have to go. Well, you see, Yab is here on the governing board for just four weeks or less than four weeks. And I think I give you um, the answer. Uh, the decision was taken, as I said, by the governing board for this reason that there was no trust in the improvement of the management in the headquarters. That was the decision. And this is the also the decision, I cannot talk about the court case, but that is the decision which is brought forward also all the time in the legal environment. Thank you, Barbara. I recognize someone with this microphone. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. hello, my name is Patrick. Um, there are also a lot of uh, rumors about travel expenses. That's why I have the question, does IFLA have a clear policy? What is acceptable? Um, is this policy um, published? and what um, checks are in place for this kind of policy. Thank you for that question. I am, I am, well, you know my name, I'm Kirsten Bold, and I was the interim treasurer. And uh, this, this, this question was raised in, uh, in the governing board. And we have a, a full um, open uh, document which shows uh, all the travel expenses. And we are within the budget, except for the London meeting. And there's no, no um, overpay, nothing to, uh, to uh, worry about in uh, all the expenses. And then I think I might can do, tell you what we'll do in the future. Well, I thank you for this question, uh, because it was my first question when people asked about it. What, are, what is the policy? Well, OK. You will see uh, in, in Article 16.4.4, if I remember well, if I'm well informed, uh, that uh, there's some kind of guideline on what travel expenses should look like. Is there a written policy currently? No, but the organization is acting fully as if there were such a policy. So one of the things that <laughs> I will do uh, uh, very shortly is to introduce that policy just to make it clear to everybody what it's about. And uh, probably when we get the interim control, they will also remark this, well, you don't have uh, the policies. So we advise you to write that one, but uh, we don't see any discrepancy. 
Thank you. Now, you were next at the microphone, so that's okay, fine. Thank fair you. Enough. Um, uh, hi, my name is Carolina Andersdotter. I work as a researcher at Olbrachen University. I have a few questions. I will do them all at once, I think, and then you can ask me again if you got the first part, I guess. Uh, so first question, uh, there seems to be a conflict of interest between IFLA and SIGL since the former Secretary General of IFLA is still Secretary General of SIGL. Uh, so I wonder how IFLA would deal financially with the potential separation from SIGL because as I understood yesterday, when Kirsten was in the Nordic session, they fi finance a lot of IFLA's operations. So that is the first question. Uh, second Pardon one me, is, no. why do you think- Pardon me. Wait, wait. Let us do one question at a time, and then I'll go to this microphone okay. and then back. Okay, right. thank you. I think maybe I'll let you explain what could that you, is. Could you, could you repeat your first question, please, because and perhaps stay away from the mic. It's, it's hard to, to hear what you say. Okay, is this fine? Is this better? Okay, there seems to be a conflict of interest between IFLA and SIGL since the former Secretary General of IFLA is still Secretary General of SIGL. And I know he's not doing those things now because he's on leave, but he still has that formal position. So I just wanted to make that clear that I'm aware of that fact. Uh, and I wonder how IFLA would deal financially with a potential separation from SIGL. Well, SIGL, as uh, Jaap just said, is a totally independent entity. It's a foundation by Dutch law, by the way, because it's also located in the Netherlands. The seat is in the Netherlands. And Sigel, I, I put it a bit like uh, very, uh, very easy phrasing, Sigel can do what they want. There is no obligation from IFLA to do anything with Sigel. There is no obligation from Sigel to do anything with IFLA. But SIGL has, of course, as a foundation, statutes and remit and objectives. And the objectives are to support the global library field. IFLA is an organization that works for the global library field and supports libraries all over the world. So SIGL decided, not is not forced, decided to give money to IFLA to execute certain tasks. Sigel can at any time say, oh no, we now sponsor I don't know whom, as long as it works with the statutes on Dutch law. Because you know, perhaps it's in many countries like that, that foundations have special rights, have special tax privileges, and if these tax privileges are not put into reality by the actions and the activities of the foundation, you lose these privileges. So everybody who knows about, I think there are many people in the room who are also responsible for smaller or even bigger foundations. Everyone knows that the remit of the foundation, the objectives of the foundation is the main guidance um, guide, guiding force, maybe, what the foundation does. Okay, well, well, Just a Dutch minute, I, I, okay. I've, I've not finished. Um, and Sigel is supporting IFLA with a lot of money without interfering into any of IFLA's professional issues, without interfering into any of IFLA's strategic issues. This is not the case. And I know that there is this allegation that IFLA is even reigned, I heard, by Sigel. It is not. It is paid by Sigel generously without any expectation of fulfilling demands or requests apart from fulfilling the need to comply with the statutes and to comply with Dutch tax law. Well, Dutch law is certainly fascinating. Uh, my question Excuse was, me, the what, next, is, what is the pardon GD's me, plan? Pardon me, I'm asking you, please. You'll have another turn. I want now to turn oh, to the I next microphone. To to there are many people who wish to be heard here, and we want to be sure that everyone has time at least once. So now I will turn to our colleague from Alexandria. Yes, um, it's Dina Yusuf from the Library of Alexandria, and uh, I've been uh, uh, 
working for uh, the Arabic office. So we were ho we're hosting the Arabic office for IFLA for uh, it's from, from 2007. It's better uh, than doing the math. <laughs> So um, we we had su financial support from IFLA for uh, for some time, and um, yani we were uh, given uh, an annual budget, uh, but we haven't been using the budget for a few years. Out of well, we found that we are handling uh, the things at the, the library uh, fine. But I just want to make sure that these budgets would be available when uh, I and if uh, we will ever get. Um, I get I get the need to uh, use of these budgets. So uh, uh, language offices and uh, regional offices were given. Were um, were uh, yani we have an allocated budget uh, yearly for the use of our expenses for some expenses, and then we used to use these or some of these budgets, and then. As the Library of Alexander is hosting the Arabic office, we did a lot of coverage for other expenses. And for, for uh, like for six, seven years, we haven't used any of IFLA's uh, money. But then in the future, if we want to use the annual budget, it will it be there uh, available? I just want to make sure that these things are still, uh, that, that these budgets are still allocated for uh, language offices and uh, regional offices. So the basic question is about IFLA support of IFLA's regional offices. Okay. I think the answer on that is that you please uh, contact the headquarter with your demand and then we will put it on the table of the governing board and decide if uh, YAP has enough money in the budget for that or not. And just a question concerning Siegel. Siegel is free to decide who is the Secretary General. And uh, we had also talks with the board of Siegel. They were surprised by the decision of the governing board, what I can understand and what was perhaps a mistake not to integrate them into this decision. But we had to decide immediately. It was really an emergency situation. And we have talks with the Siegel board, which is also represented here, uh, that they will continue to support IFLA, but we have to improve the collaboration between the two separate entities. Do you have a further question? Thank you, yes, and thank you for a little better response, I guess. My second question is, do you think IFLA's lack of uh, internal transparency could be a threat to IFLA's credibility in our advocacy to, for freedom of expression, freedom of information and transparency? What do you mean with internal? Well, the lack of internal transparency. Yes. You've obviously received a lot of critique because you haven't been communicating enough and there has been a call for transparency. But I'm not interested in discussing that. I'm interested in, in how, does, how do you think this could have an impact on our credibility as global actors to advocate for these very important things? The main thing is that neither the president nor the governing board nor the members um, try or not try, but damage the reputation of IFLA. So we are all one group, and I think we all have to consider what the reputation of IFLA is and how we keep it and how we improve it. That's totally right. And the lack of transparency that you are mentioning, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, but I will say something to it. The lack of transparency is uh, caused mainly, if there is a lack, if you if you qualify it as a lack, um, is mainly caused by legal written constraints which we have to take into account in order to have a legal, accurate and a legal, um, not riskful process. I don't think that as, far, uh, as long as um, this issue came up, which we are now discussing now, uh, there was a big lack of transparency. I actually did not know that that is a big lack of transparency. There might be, of course, uh, in former times also been that there the information came out, not immediately. We are, Halo said this, we are aware that we can improve this, that's for sure. And as long as we are legally okay with it, 
we will improve it. And Yab just also let you know that um, the finances will be also um, more transferred to the members quarterly. He talked about maybe quarterly reports and so on. And I am happy when uh, these quarterly reports are uh, very well acknowledged by the membership. Thank you. Thank you. This microphone, please. Thanks, uh, Stuart Hamilton, the chair of the European Regional Division. Um, I have two questions, but I think the issue of the SIGL looking around the room, I'm, I'm not entirely certain that everybody really understands what that is. Um, it stands for the Stichting IFLA Global Libraries Foundation. Is that correct? Uh, if, we, if someone wants it in the room, and I see, <laughs> I'm sure there is, we could, have, we could have an explanation about SIGL here from the people here. Okay, well, that would be quite useful in some respects potentially, but I'm sure there might be other questions, but we've had it explained in various meetings that the SIGL pays 66% of IFLA's operating costs. Is there a concern, considering what you just said, that effectively, I'm paraphrasing now, but that SIGL could take its money and, and go away and sponsor somebody else at any other time? Is yes. there a concern that with 66% of the organisation's operating costs, that seems a, a very large risk for us to be taking on behalf of the organization. Uh, I start and then Yap may go on. Uh, Stuart, you have worked as Deputy Secretary General when I came to the board in 2011. You very well remember, I assume, uh, how IFLA was at that time when there was not the money coming from Sigel or from other institutions, regular money. There was for a long time coming money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as long as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was had that department with Deborah Jacobs uh, supporting public libraries in the world and that was project money that was not operating money that was project money for certain project MLAS um, uh, BSLA and and the uh, young leaders projects I remember very well um, now IFLA has evolved. There is many more people. I think the staff of IFLA since then has doubled. And so the steady money coming from the Siegel Foundation helps IFLA to be like that. This, by the way, is one reason why IFLA has so many terminated contracts, not terminated, but terminating contracts two years, one, one reason is Dutch law. So there is projects and there is people who work in contracts for two years, maybe a third year yeah, or not, I don't know, you will tell that. And so there is a turnover of staff quite often because there's this terminating contracts related to projects as well, also now. Additionally, to these 66% of the operational costs, it's not governance who is paid. It's not governance, it's not us who is paid with that money. Uh, Sigel pays staff costs, additionally, pays staff costs for permanent staff of IFLA who work for certain projects in a proportion from 10% of the staff costs to 50% or even 70%. Additionally, there is staff working for IFLA who is paid 100% by SIGL, mainly related to special projects, to special items, themes IFLA is tackling. Altogether, this is 1.5 million euros per year. 1.5 million euros per year. The income of the Federation, the income of the Federation from membership fees and other activities, which is not that much, is between 700 and 800, well, sometimes it's 900,000 euros. So now you can see the proportions. This is very important, this is very important to know. And the thing is, these proportions are sometimes varying because the projects are varying, of course. 
And now I hand over to Jaap and he will give you the finance, the real finance explanation. Well, you already told a lot of things that I was going to tell. But um, when looking at the future, and when I'm talking about stable future, I'm first thing looking at how solid is the feet under my, uh, the ground under my feet. So I need to know the regular income, regular expenses, really understanding it, the, the cost and income structure, then also apply the, the, uh, the civil uh, funds, and then have a look from a risk management point of view, what would happen if, and what would happen if these funds were drawn away? What would that mean also, but that's more a, a strategic discussion for the rest of the organization, for all the work you want to do in the fields? How many funds can we provide for that? But we first must understand, really truly understand, how solid is the ground, ground under my feet? So in the annual report that will be presented over 2022, I already promise you it will be made up of regular results and extraordinary results. The extraordinary result relating, of course, to all the costs that were incurred because of we have this special situation now. And it helps understanding, if we look at the future, what are we looking at? What scenarios can we, uh, can we make? Is it an answer to your question? May I, add, may I, add, may I add something, yeah. Stuart? <laughs> sorry. Um, you heard just Jaap. And that was one reason to have a person like Jaap as a treasurer, uh, elected by membership treasurer, not only a, uh, who is, uh, well, a competent finance, finance man who knows finances, or the person who should about finances, and that was one reason why the new statutes, when we worked on the new statutes between 2019 and 2021, remember the new statutes were endorsed in February 2021 and came into power, came effective August last year. And through the elections now, we have an elected person uh, as treasurer, which we never had. We had a governing board member who took the responsibility of being a treasurer like in many other associations. And what I want to stress here is that the, the figures, the numbers are there. We have an excellent finance director. We have an excellent finance director and Jaap is nodding. He had already, he got deep into many, many points and also Kirsten, when she took over as temporary treasurer, the numbers, the figures are there. It's all there. What was missing, maybe, was the relation between everything which was there as finance numbers and the step to the strategic level. And now, with a, an, an elected treasurer in this important function, um, we think we can gap this lap no, we can, we can close this gap, sorry. We can close, we can close this gap much better and have a look into the future in a much better way. I feel no pressure. <laughs> Would I, can, I, can I just uh, comment very quickly? So, so what I'm hearing there is that no, it's, it's not a risk, so I appreciate the, 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 the answer. I just wondered, the reason why I'm concerned when you said that, that Sigil could, could effectively fund somebody else is we've reached a situation where one organisation has removed the Secretary General because of mismanagement, but the other organisation which funds the first organisation has retained the same person. Do you think there's a potential conflict to work out there, particularly if one is funding the, the other? First of all, there is a difference. Uh, I see some ladies from the Sigil board here. Thank you very much that you're here and thank you for your support. Um, there is a big difference of having more than 20 people to manage uh, coming from 17 different countries or 15 to 17 different countries in a very complex work or having a board uh, of, or having a foundation with no operational issues. I think so, isn't it? There is no operational issues, but a foundation needs to have a person who is called secretary general or whatever. 
So this, this person who is the secretary general to Sigel has totally different tasks to do than a person who is secretary general to such a complex organization with this amount of staff, with this amount of different tasks to do, um, and therefore I don't see really a conflict of interest. Thank you. I hear reactions. There may be differences of opinion, but now I want to move to this microphone, the next person who is speaking. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. My name is John DeSantis. I'm a delegate from the United States. Um, I think this is just a quick question. It's been reported that the management issues involving the Secretary General have been um, persisting for years. Do you have any idea why these concerns were not brought to the governing board earlier? There were talks about this also in the governing board. I remember that in, I think it was 2019, there was one person who came out with it. This person is still active in coming out. And this was talked over and there we started to, start, uh, to uh, work on the policies which were lacking. And these there's drafts of these policies. We started to hire a HR person which we did not have. And so we started to do this, and now this augmented, obviously, in problems. But we started to do this. Ellen? Yes, thank you very much. Just once again, I'm Ellen Tice from Stellenbosch University and chair of the IFLA-FE um, Advisory Committee. Um, I firstly like to thank um, the president and the governing board for having this open session this morning uh, in order to update the membership, which we have the right to ask. And secondly, to have this engagement to try and find and at least give an indication on how IFLA is going to move forward with this. So we appreciate that. But I do want to say based on some of the responses to the questions that have been asked so far, that the concerns that I had before the session this morning, I'm even more concerned now. Because some of the responses seems to be contradictory. And I want to give just the example in terms of the discussion or the questions that were previously around the seagull. The explanation that it is independent uh, that it can do what it wants to do um, shows clearly that the majority of IFLA members, committed members over many, many years, paid members, that they probably don't know much or enough about, first of all, as we've heard, who the seagull is, secondly, what it's supposed to do. So from what we've heard from the president, who said it is completely independent, then the delegate, uh, secretary general, or whatever he is called, then said there was the issue around the fact that there was a question when the board decided that the secretary general uh, 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 employment with IPLA should be terminated about how that should, uh, why that happened, and then the acting, the delegate said that um, that they should probably have. Um, uh, consulted uh, with the seagull, and then there is the issue around the administration and the link there. Now, how can the seagull not be so independent when the name of IFLA is in the name of the foundation? <laughs> My understanding from what we have, when it was reported to the General Assembly, previous General Assemblies, we know that there was a relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that when they uh, winded down the business of the program, that there was a lot of negotiations and it was reported even in the uh, finances to the general report. There were already questions raised around, you know, how does this work? But the General Assembly and IFLA members have up till today we heard now some of that information, but maybe that is the first clarification 
that needs to be required. So the proposers of the letter have in fact asked that that be looked into because there certainly seems to be a lack of information and a lack of understanding in terms of the seagull, its functions, its relationship with IPLA. I'm not saying, and no, I'm not expecting a response to. This is just as an introduction to say that there is an issue here. The other reason why I say there is a conflict, even in an explanation, because soon after the first communication from the board to the members to explain about the situation with the Secretary General, as well as then also following that, the departure of the then president elect, as well as the treasurer, that there was a communication from the chair of the board of Siegel to the membership on the IPLA list, giving also a statement in terms of what has been going on. And I'm not, this is not putting blame or saying anything. I'm just saying it is these kinds of communications that leads to people questioning then what is actually going on. And that is really all, and this is why I say I appreciate that we're getting this opportunity to be able to clarify these issues. So these are, this is just my question in terms of going forward. Um, and that is, I appreciate again the update from the president, but what I didn't hear and I would like to ask, if the governing board accepts that there is a crisis in IPLA, in the way that IPLA had been governed. I also find it extraordinary that the new treasurer and the president then explaining why this position is here. How come somebody that has been appointed a few weeks ago or now says that he needs to, to find out the questions that he asked. So surely when the foundation was set up, and really at that time there should have been clarity how this is going to work and what the impact and how and this. So how come IPLA had been operating then for the period that it had until now and now the questions are being asked. So therefore, my, what I'm, the result of what I've just explained is indeed that there seems to be, and I want to know, is there an acceptance that there is a crisis within IPLA, that it does affect the reputation of IFLA, the integrity of IFLA, that it may have an impact on how this association go forward. And if that is the case, if there is that acceptance that mistakes have been made, and we need to, and not about the individuals or who or whatever, just that, and I appreciate because I hear steps are being taken, and that is also a very good sign. So the, the question is, we acknowledge the legal processes, as I said, the only thing that we would really like to know is, is there a commitment to take the process that the proposers of IPLA members and the signatories have asked that we look into a way and a process on how we then going to make sure that we deal with these issues. Of course, the board and IPLA HQ dealing with the matters that they have to do but we're looking here at the future of IFLA and the continued support from the volunteers to make sure this association that we all have the privilege to be part of and as a model that we've had in the world in terms of professional associations, that we deal with that. So I, my, quest, my only question is, the tool is this, <laughs> is the commitment First, that we accept something did not go right, that something went wrong, that we have to address that, that we commit for a process on how we're going to go forward and deal with this, and that members can have the confidence in the board to ensure that IFLA is and stay what it should be. Thank you. I thank you very much for this emotional reply, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, I already went into that. I am committed to make this organization better. I cannot judge about the past, but I can see that 
only in the way things are communicated, things can be improved. That's why I also reach out to the organization to help me with that. I can say, okay, this is what I want to tell. What is the best way to convey the message so that everybody understands? As far as the relation of the various uh, limited liability companies, the structure is concerned. It's part of my workshop, Finance for Non-Financials, but it doesn't start with finance. It understands with understanding what is the structure like in the organization that you're working for? Why was it constructed like that? What kind of contracts do we have? How does that work? And then, at the end of the day, we start talking, okay, based on what we know before, this is how it works. So, yes, uh, well, I can only stress, it's maybe confusing. I heard you say Sigel, it says IFLA. Yes, it's exactly that this foundation, this stichting, was, uh, uh, it was, was founded because all the monies were intended for IFLA. They could have called it stichting, libraries in the world, or whatever. The intention of the giver of the money was that the money would land at IFLA. So yes, maybe confusing, but really, 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 I will explain and I can explain that there's, there's they are two separate, separate things. I'm even happy with it, because in my city, if I receive money for a certain purpose, I have to provide a lot of explanations of why I spent the money, what were the results, etc. As far as I know, these questions aren't even asked. Have you ever applied with the, Euro sorry, the Europeans for funding by the European Commission? You spend more money uh, uh, justifying yourself than you spend on your project. I see people laugh, so it's, but it's, that's the truth, and we may, we may be so happy with this. And yes, I understand the concerns. Are there conflicts of interest? We, we are able to tackle those questions. So I hope one year from now, when we may be in the same room, we can uh, look each other in the eyes and say, yes, things have improved. I'm committed to that. And so am I. And um, I have to say, we started working in this governing board last August, almost from day one. Problems, well, just came on the, on the floor, on the table. So, well, it's a new uh, structure, problems arrived, and from my point of view, all we have done and worked very hard on is to keep trust, and now we are really trying to restore trust. I fully understand that all the things we have done can be very, very hard to see through. Um, so I really hope that this session and the letter you send us is the start of rebuilding trust because that's my aim to do it. And well, things can be improved. And sure, we m have made some mistakes, but now we, we will, well, repair how, as good as we can. And as Jab is saying, we have to increase transparency. So I really hope we can s look at today and the, the General Assembly as a kind of, well, we look into the future and we work hard to restore your trust and we are fully committed and uh, I hope we can collaborate on this. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over this microphone, please. Um, Tina Tato. Um, so I'm stuck on that first word, restoring trust, right? So um, some of the responses that you have been giving are not clear or transparent. So, um, and it feels like the governance board is not listening. You hear, but you are not listening. And um, so restoring trust and confidence in a positive and sustainable way will take collective and collaborative effort. Agree? So does the governance board have an idea of what it will take to comply or to to reach the appropriate level of trust from the members 
you, we are a membership organisation. So um, do you have an idea of what it will take to comply regarding cost, process, resources, time, structure, maybe change? As you just said, uh, we are in a, on the way, and as Kirsten just uh, explained, and uh, I think Ellen used the word crisis, like others also have used the word crisis, and I think many of you in this room know that crises create challenges, and that crises also can create chances. And therefore, I would like to ask you to trust in us that we will use these creating, coming out of crisis, of problematic situation, coming out, uh, these problematic situation solutions for the change which might be done. And many things which should be done should be also done with a new secretary general. That will be the leading person in the operations. That will also be the leading person in the representation and in many regards of the organization. And what we can do as governing board at the moment and the delegate at the moment, we are going to do. Tomorrow, we are wrapping up what we have heard from you today. And we cannot now say we are doing A, B, C, D. What we can say is that we hear you, and I really say we hear you, we are here to hear you, and that what we heard will be brought to the governing board tomorrow, and this is not, we have more tomorrow a session of three hours, we have also other things to do, this will not be finalized in the governing board, but in the governing board will be, I hope, because I am not the governing board, we are not the governing board, there are other people as well on the governing board. This, what we hear now, will be talked over in the governing board and we hopefully will come out of that session with a roadmap, with steps to do, and then these steps have to be taken. Christina. Christina de Castell, I'm the vice chair of the North America Regional Division. And coming from a perspective of a large employer, I want to further clarify the independent relationship of IFLA HQ to the SIGL, because one of the things that's most important in the success of the work of IFLA is the staff, and that they are in a place where they can move forward successfully. So my question is, I understand the SIGL to be an independent organization that grants money to IFLA as an organization. Recognizing the management issues that we that the governing board has been attempting to resolve, can you clarify whether there is any oversight or employment relationship or communication that happens between IFLA HQ staff and members of the SIGL? Sorry, uh, I'm not an English native speaker. Please, would you explain or? Pronounce your questions slow, then I can answer. Yeah, I didn't understand it. Yeah, the fundamental question is, is there any employment or oversight relationship or communication that occurs between the members of the board or um, secretary general of the SIGL and the staff at IFLA? Over you, you ask if there are in, in, uh, salaries for uh, overtime, is that right? No, supervision, oversight, communication between the SIGL and the IFLA HQ staff. So not the payment, because I assume, if I'm wrong, please correct me, I assume that the grant money goes to the organization, but does the SIGL communicate with the individual HQ staff? Does SIGL have any oversight of H quarter staff, headquarters staff? Yeah, it's a it gives a joint agreement with SIGL about that is very clear what is paid by SIGL for salary and for the operational cost and also 
there are some contracts directly between Siegel and staff members. So there are contracts between Siegel and staff members, which means that the Siegel is in fact employing HQ staff members. So I think we would understand that to not be an independent relationship um, and an area, certainly an area of concern. If someone else has further clarification, that would be appreciated. I understand you now clearer. There is a difficulty we, we uh, realize now that there are different contractors, employers. Uh, one is Siegel and the other is Evla. Still now, the general secretary was the same person and therefore the leading and the management of the staff, there was no differentiation. When I started in April, we realized this situation because before there was no di distinguishing between the two uh, categories or uh, contracts and uh, we are working on that and I have signals from Siegel that they not want to have their own staff furthermore. But it's a question of taxes also, and therefore we, the, this complex construction has um, developed. And we have to deal with that and to look for better and clearer and simpler uh, solutions. So you're working to unwind those contracts and transfer them to IFLA as an organization? We are, if I may, we are working on clear situation. What this outcome might be is not clear. Just for everyone, we are talking about Texas and now I hear some room, some warming around with Texas, Texas. Um, every hundred euros which comes from Sigel to IFLA will be taxed by the Dutch government by 21%. So that means from 100 euros going from, tech, from Sigil to IFLA, IFLA receives 79 euros. To prevent this situation, there is an agreement between, uh, that is legal, totally okay, an agreement between Sigil and IFLA, a so-called joint account agreement. This was not established by IFLA, this was not established by Sigel without the substantial advice of Dutch lawyers. Obviously in the Netherlands this, sounds, this happens, I don't know. Um, and so the money which comes from Sigel goes at 100% to IFLA based on this joint account agreement. This joint account agreement is important losing 20% of the money or not. That is quite, quite, a, quite a thing to do. That is one thing. Um, I don't know whether you have, I had staff which was not paid in my li by, by my library. I had staff that had not a contract with my library but worked in my library and the oversight was from my library from the managers in my library. I don't know whether you had that, but this is quite, can happen when another organization has staff, contracted staff with contracts, but sends that out to another organization where this staff works. This is more or less the legal background for this. What we now know or what we now should do is make more clear who is the senior persons to these people. One thing which is very important, and we know this now, I, well, the Europeans at least, that is GDPR reasons, privacy reasons, which are really very strict in Europe now. And one reason is that the contracts are safe under GDPR reasons. So that is a thing uh, or an issue that Harlow just mentioned. And we are working on this and Siegel is very interested in finding a solution with this. By the way, tomorrow morning there is a meeting between the governing board and the Siegel board, so to start the communication, to have a look at the issues which might be there, if they are there, and when they are there, they should be resolved in a way that everyone who is involved has a good feeling of the outcome. 
I just want to be very clear that I'm not asking a financial question, but rather a question that is related to the responsibility of the governing board to the staff of ICWA to ensure them that they're not placed in a position where they are at risk of being, um, feeling a continuing feeling of being bullied by the SIGL, given the, the past concerns you've had about the management. So I don't need that question answered, but I just want to make very clear what my concern is. Thank you, Christina. And I was going to say, after Ellen's intervention, too, that while I invited questions, we're also very open to suggestions. And some of you have kind of combined the two, but it's really important to be doing both because we need to have solutions to certain issues. I see you've been standing there for quite a while. I don't know who you are, but if you could go next at this microphone, and then we'll come here. Great. Thanks, Thanks Winston. My name is Daryl Green. I'm the chair of the Red Lincoln, uh, Special Collections Standing Committee. My question follows on a bit from the, the previous question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to commend those who are on stage today. Thank you for putting yourselves on the, the, the dissection table. It's uh, commendable, and, and thank you. Um, sorry. Can you speak more slowly? Yes, of yes. course. Uh. I'll start again. My name is Daryl Green. I'm the chair of the Rare Books and Special Collections Committee. Um, and my question follows on uh, from the previous question. But I did want to thank and commend those who are on stage today. Uh, for putting yourselves on the dissection table. It's uncomfortable, and it's commendable, and thank you. My question is uh, from the standing committee's perspective. Although we, uh, we do work with the governing board, much of our work, and I, I can probably say this um, not out of turn, much of our work in the standing committees is with the IFLA HQ staff. And our concern has been these past six and eight months of the quality of uh, work and the quality of life that the staff do, and to express our love for the staff. I was wondering if uh, the delegates and the governing board could speak a little bit about how you're planning to improve uh, the workplace for IFLA HQ staff, uh, and also uh, plans for developing those staff contracts to permanent and also uh, uh, higher quality retention. Thank you. Perhaps uh, first uh, answer on what uh, I had explained already a little bit, what we did in the headquarter. We established a new management structure because when I started, I had uh, half of the staff was, uh, I was the direct line manager, the general secretary. That was a situation I couldn't handle. And we have now four team leaders. They are responsible for different tasks, office, secretariat, Public, uh, policy and ad advocacy, membership uh, service and communication. And we have a new structure and we started to have each week a, a meeting with this uh, management uh, responsible, the leaders of these teams. And we have every once and, uh, a, a, a staff meeting together with all the um, staff members and uh, in, in reality, in presence in Den Haag. And we have started now to have uh, an, uh, every two weeks a Zoom meeting with all the staff members. And that is the first step. And uh, I could just say we have, a, we have a, an Im incredible uh, support, me, me supporting team. And I want to give them a warm applause from your side for this conference they organized. They do a really a great job and they uh, need the support to have a better climate and I think the reaction I got till now, we are on a good way. And concerning the contracts, that is a really special situation. I'm not used to have such a situation in Switzerland. Uh, we have to look how we can deal with that because uh, we cannot change the Dutch law. And the Dutch law says after three years, you have to give them permanent contracts. And so as far as we don't have the money for ongoing paying the staff longer, we cannot take this responsibility. We have also the responsibility to care about the staff security. And that is what I can say at the moment. I, I just have a short addition because we get, uh, we, in the governing board, we get um, reports 
from the em employer's uh, representative board. And I can see the uh, increase of a positive uh, atmosphere at the headquarters. And I really have to, to stress that I feel a, a very huge responsibility to support staff, to be open to staff, so they can uh, do or continue with their great jobs, because staff at HIF IFLA headquarters, they are brilliant. And I'm so happy to have these reports from their representatives. Thank you. Thank you. We have just eight minutes left. There are three questioners left, so let's do it as quickly as we can. I'd like to hear from everyone who's at their microphone, but there won't be time for more than the three remaining. Please. You're next. I recall the first set of slides, you had a list of things that were happening, and the last was this court case that is yet to happen. I assume the court case means there's something contested, um, but nobody's mentioned what the, the potential outcomes of that court case are and how that might impact uh, the selection of a new secretary general or the future of IFLA uh, based on what happens uh, in the court. So if you could explain that a bit, I'd appreciate it. Perhaps uh, as lawyer, I can say that depends on this, uh, the point. If you are the judge, if you are the, law, the labor lawyer of the company or the employee. So the court case is about how will be the contract terminated. That's the court case. Let, I be, I'll be quick, uh, and I will start by quoting Barbara that uh, we work at IFLA as, as a family. And out of transparency, wouldn't it, be, uh, wouldn't it have been uh, better to hear from the family member eliminated from the family, especially that this family member, which is uh, Gerald, uh, he was the authorized and trusted voice for IFLA for all regions for such a long time, so uh, when, he t when he was eliminated, uh, we would have loved to hear his, uh, what he has to say in this uh, situation. Well, Dina, I appreciate your, <laughs> your idea, but this is not possible, I'm so sorry, but it, this is not possible because of also of legal issues. I will give Anne the last word, which is always a good idea. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, just, just sorry. Um, may I? Did I understood you uh, understand you wrongly that he was not heard at all, or that he should be here? Heard. He was heard. He was heard. So he was heard. The the interview phase, the second phase, uh, there were two interviews uh, with him. No, of course not. <laughs> no, no, no. That's the legal issue then. Oh, you you wanted you want, you thought he could be heard by IFLA members. That's 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 a legal that's il, that's a legal problem which would have not been possible. All right, let's move on to Anne because we're at the end of our time. Um, I'm sure his lawyers would have told him not to do that. Uh, but anyway, and yeah. our lawyers, Anne, as well. Yeah, uh, uh, Anne Okerson from the United States. I've been waiting for an hour for someone to ask this question, but no one has, so I will. Um, I'm hearing the ka-ching, ka-ching of cash registers. Um, I'm hearing there are a couple of salaries paid to secretary generals. I'm hearing about legal expenses, attorneys, court cases, a possible settlement down the line uh, with the secretary general at the end of the contract. And I'm wondering what the impact of this is on IFLA's finances. Um, how will we pay for this? Is there some kind of IFLA insurance for these kinds of situations? Because I fear it could make us vulnerable financially. Many questions I, I hear. No, no, no. He needs to answer the question. Well, only one I want him to answer the question in the very short remaining time that we have available, Sean. Please. Uh, I, 
can understand everybody, uh, you hear the cash register ring, uh, so mic up. So I'm going like, that, like this. Um, yes, uh, was one of my first worries as well. What is the basis of this organization and how is this going to affect the um, long-term stability of the organization? Um, of course, the ruling of the court case not being clear yet, and we don't, we cannot only guess about uh, what we have to pay out. The thing for the future is that we, um, at least my intention is to put forward a motion to pay the person according to Dutch law for public institutions, which puts a cap on the salary, uh, being as transparent about that as possible. So we as public libraries have to abide by that, even in our uh, um, annual reports, there's a special page dedicated to the amount of people we pay out to our CEOs and whoever. So the only thing I can, I can do is make a change and come back to you as soon as possible with, with the stability of the future financial situation. I can, um, I'm sure this will not um, make IFLA fall because luckily we have reserves so we can, we can manage. But only for this time, we cannot keep on. And that's why it's very important that when we end this year, we have the ord ordinary figures and the extraordinary. And we will, we will cope, but it's, it's not a thing we can keep on doing. Thank you. Do you have an urgent question? Yes, uh, this is about uh, this crisis indicate us that uh, the governing board must have a legal person to revise its decision. Second, IFLA must look for fundraising to increase its financial resources. Okay, thank you very much. I would not dare really to try to summarize all of what we've heard today, but clearly there are three issues that keep emerging. One has the, to do with the relationship to the SIGL, the other concern for the staff, and the other more regular reporting on the finances, I think. I really want to thank our panelists for organizing this in the first place, for coming and answering as forthrightly as they could the questions they were asked. Thank the questioners and thank all of you who came showing your great interest in the future of IFLA. So with that, this session is adjourned.